Next up, we'll have a presentation from Emerson uh, Mora. He will be presenting around the managing digital coherent optics in routers. Emerson is a distinguished architect at Cisco, and this is Emerson's first time presenting at Nanog. It's a pleasure to have him here today with us. Emerson, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Perfect. So I'm going to talk about digital coherent topics. But because before I start, let me try to learn a little bit from you. Who is familiar with the technology? Mm, just a few of you. Who is a, consider yourself an IP network engineer? And who will consider yourself a transport network engineer? OK. So good news is, if you, if you are a transport network engineer, probably you are familiar with what I'm going to talk about. And hopefully, I'll share a different perspective on how we can do the management of this new technology. If you are an IP network engineer and you don't know nothing about optics, I would encourage you to pay a lot of attention to today's talk because sooner or later, this technology is going to cross your way. Because moving forward, there is no more cost efficient way of implementing high speed optics other than digital coherent optics. So before I start, let me just acknowledge the collaboration of my colleague, Phil Bedard, who is, I understand is also here today. Uh, he is a principal engineer with Cisco and has done a lot of work on IP and optical integration and contributed to putting this content together. And in, the, in this session, I'm going to start by first giving you some context on why we need digital coherent optics. Of course, coherent optics is not a new technology. Digital coherent optics is relatively new, but it has been around for a while. But it has gained a lot of attention recently with the availability of 400 gigabits Ethernet. And then hopefully you understand why eventually this technology is going to get in your way sooner or later. Then I'm going to explain a little bit the technology itself, because if we're going to manage this thing, we need to understand what we're trying to manage. And hopefully some of the differences with gray optics is going to become more evident to you. And finally, I'm going to talk about the management. So I expect to spend probably the last half of the session talking about management. However, just to be very clear, you know, I'm not pretending I'm going to address a long-standing problem we have in our industry, which is how we manage complex networks that are multi-vendor, multi-technology, that involve various generations of technologies proprietary systems. We know that's a hard problem to solve. And I can tell in my 25 years of experience in this industry, I have yet to see you know, the final solution to that problem. So instead, what I'm going to talk about is what are the new tools we have available today to build systems that are more future-proof. And I'm very optimistic about the future given the tools and the architectures that the industry has been working on. So my focus will be more in that sense. As I mentioned before, coherent optics is not new. Digital coherent optics has been around for a while, but it got a lot of momentum with 400 gigabits, uh, especially 400 gigabit Ethernet. And why that's the case? Well, first, 400 gig is very appealing to everyone in our industry. It brings three key attributes to networking that are very important in today's context. Scale is the first one, then simplicity, and the last one is sustainability. And what I mean by that is the silicon technology that we have available today that gives us tens of terabits of capacity in a single network processor. In fact, the state of the art of the technology allows us to reach something around 25.6 terabits of switching capacity in one network processor. It's very power efficient. It's highly optimized. But in order to get all that capacity, no surprises, we need the optics that will allow us to get 
all that capacity out of the router or the switch. Now, the good news is that the industry has made a lot of advances, advances in building state-of-the-art optics, leveraging technologies like silicon photonics. And in the context of this session, digital coherent optics. And without those technologies, we would never be able to extract all that capacity from the systems. And by combining the silicon technology and the optics technology that we have available today, we can build very efficient systems. So we have systems today that can easily scale over 100 terabits per second and can be very power efficient for a variety of use cases by leveraging the combination of these technologies. So we have 400 gig today in platforms that are as small as a Nexus router that we can deploy in the hundreds of thousands in the networks all the way to chassis-based systems that can scale to hundreds of terabits of capacity. Now, if 400 gig is the way to go, then coherent optics is the way to build optical interfaces for 400 gigabits Ethernet. And why that's the case? Well, first, as we go to higher speeds, unfortunately, we have to deal with the physics. And the physics of the fiber for higher speeds become n squared problem, which means every step we take towards a higher speed, we have a squared problem to deal with. And in order to mitigate some of those so-called optical impairments on the fiber that are an exponential problem, we had to build these optical interfaces using different technologies and different architectures. The good news is that we are not the first ones to solve the problem, like the optical industry is actually solving this problem much later than all other industries. It has been solved or addressed by the radio industry, by the cable industry many years ago. And all that we are doing is really reapplying the techniques that have been developed by those industries to solve the problem in the optical domain. But coherent optics is just the best solution as we go higher speeds. And if coherent optics is the best solution, well, Digital coherent optics is the best possible implementation we have available today for coherent optics. Because it allows us to have all the performance gains that we have with coherent optics in a very small form factor, in a very cost-effective implementation as we are going to see here. Now, not only that, digital coherent optics make it very easy to in integrate this technology into any sort of host equipment. It uses standard cages on the host equipment for 400 gig coherent optics, digital coherent optics is available in various form factors. And good news is for the first time in our industry to have high-end DWM integration into the routers, we can use standard hardware, which means that you can take any 400 gig capable router that you have, and from a hardware standpoint, it has everything that is needed to have the digital coherent optics integration. And last but not least, with all this technology, now we can rethink the way we design networks. We can think about more efficient network architectures. And one such example is routed optical networking, which I'm going to talk very quickly about in a few minutes. Now, just to wrap up, the business benefit of digital coherent optics are many, from much lower power consumption, compared to DWM transponders, up to 95% reduction in power and cooling requirements, zero penalty in terms of faceplate density. So if I have a router line card, I don't sacrifice capacity of the line card as we had to do in previous uh, IP over DWM integrations. Much more cost effective. And also we end up with less moving parts in the network which means that we can build systems that are more agile, easier to automate, there are less moving parts, less things to break as well. Now, one application of digital coherent optics is routed optical networking. And if you're not familiar with routed optical networking, the idea is very simple. So we build an IP network design that is self-sufficient in terms of resiliency and it also has some very nice properties because we use segment routing uh, developments like circuit style segment routing to mimic the behavior of transport networks for some services. And then we can collapse all the services into one IP MPLS network. 
Now we know we have been able to do layer one, layer two, layer three services over IP and PLS networks for a long time. So what's different with this architecture? Well, the difference is if you have seen earlier this week, my colleague Errol Roberts talked about private line emulation, which is a new technology that we are developing and we are standardizing through IETF that allows us for the first time to do be transparent services over IP and PLS network, which means, for example, that I can connect, let's say, a 10 gigabit Ethernet client or a circuit over the IP and PLS network, and it will behave exactly as if we have a cable connecting them. If you have any protocols like MacSec, Synchronous Ethernet, it's going to be fully transparent. And because it's bit transparent, is constant bit rate on the transport network, and it's very predictive. And by coupling with these new architectures uh, on the software side, like SDN architectures, controllers, we can replicate the behavior of a transport network on the IP MPLS network. Now, in order to provide these services at very high speeds and also to couple with the, the growing uh, traffic demands, we do need to make this network as cost efficient as possible. And it's no surprise, we leverage the silicon technology that I mentioned before, that's very power efficient, cost efficient. And we couple, couple the, the routers with these digital coin optics to make it even better. So digital coherent optics is a fundamental part of routed optical networking. Now, before I talk about the details about how we're going to manage these optics into the routers in architectures like routed optical networking, as we saw before, let me take a step back and explain coherent optics for you that are not optical engineers. So I'll try to make it as simple as possible, but the idea with coherent optics is the following. The problem we have to deal with every time we increase the so-called uh, symbol rates or the gigabaud on the fiber, we face that n squared problem. So the trick then is to keep the baud rates as low as possible while increasing the bit rate. And in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to play with the physics of the optical channel. What coherent optics does is it takes a laser and then it splits the optical signal into components, the so-called polarization modes of the signal. We have like a vertical and a horizontal polarization mode. And then we independently modulate each of those polarization modes to carry different information across the fiber. Now in this example with 100 gigabits ethernet, what we can do, or 100 gigabit in general, what we can do is we can take the 100 gigabit signal that I want to send across the, the optical interface. We can break it into four 25 gigabits components. Guess what, for 100 gigabit Ethernet, that's very easy to do because the interface has been designed from the get-go to allow you to have that split. And then we modulate the signal using, in this case, QPSK modulation. And as a result, we have the following. We have two components the polarization modes of the signal, where each component, by using this modulation technique, can send two bits per symbol. And as such, the end result is we get to send four symbols, oh, sorry, four bits per symbol on the line. And for the fiber, even though I'm sending 100 gigabits per second, it looks like it's a 25 gigabits, uh, or gigabaud to be more precise, signal. Now, on the receiving side, coherent optics also has more components than traditional interfaces because we also have to do the, the reverse process. So we take the signal that was uh, generated at the transmission with the dual polarization mode multiplexing technology. So we have to split the polarization modes at receiving side. We need a laser on the receiving side as well. So we recover the signal, and then to mitigate some of the additional optical impairments that the signal is going to face across the fiber, we use a digital, digital signal processor. And that's going to give us an edge in terms of performance compared to non-coherent uh, technologies. In fact, 100, 100 gigabit transmission using coherent optics got so, so good that it was even better than previous generations 10 gigabits per second transmission. 
given all this technology that we have available. So that's coherent technology or coherent optics technology. What's DCO then? Well, DCO is just a state-of-the-art implementation of that technology. What DCO does, it takes what otherwise would be a transponder where we have all those modulators, the lasers, all these components implemented as discrete components in a large footprint. So to give you an idea, a 100 gig transponder is more or less the size of your laptop and consumes a lot of power. But using state-of-the-art technology, what we can do is we can take those components and we can have a more compact implementation of those components. In the case of the optical components, we use silicon photonics in modern manufacturing process to miniaturize and integrate as many components as possible. And now everything we need on the optical domain is as small as a dime coin. So it's really, really small. We do the same on the silicon side of things. So we use state-of-the-art technology. It could be seven nanometers or today probably five nanometers uh, silicon. And now we are able to squeeze all the technology into a very compact form factor. Now, 400 gigabits per second digital coherent optics can be implemented using the smallest form factor we have for 400 gig. For example, QSF PDD. And it's very power efficient. No additional requirements on the host side. And it's very cost efficient as well. And as I mentioned before, they can be deployed in standard routers uh, or switch line cards. Now, of course, it gets even better because not only we're integrating all that transponder technology into the pluggable itself, we remove a lot of components that otherwise would be required to interconnect the gray optics uh, to transponders. So like in this case, we can replace two gray optics plus a transponder plus a cabling by one digital coherent optics implementation. Now on the line side of the interface, we do have excellent specifications available today in the industry. So I included three here for you for your, your reference. We have the OIF who has produced a very efficient implementation of digital coherent optics that is optimized for 400 gigabit Ethernet clients and 100 gigabit Ethernet uh, multiplex clients. It's been optimized for metro implementations or campus implementations up to 120 kilometers. Then we have the Open Rodem, which has a very robust implementation and more flexible implementation of digital coherent optics, which aims more at the service provider industry where we have multiple clients besides Ethernet. We have things like OTN, we have a storage protocols, and we have longer distance to deal with or more optical elements that we have to cross. For example, Rodem, the reconfigurable optical to drop devices. And as such, we have the option to play with the, the line rates that we send off the fiber because by throttling down the speed of the interface, we can go longer distances or we can allow more intermediate elements in the network, like in complex rodent networks. Now, if we combine those two, we have OpenZR Plus, which takes the Ethernet cost efficiency that we have from the OIF, an Ethernet-centric implementation, with the robustness of the open rodent, because we borrowed the forward error correction of the open rodent implementation. And we have now an option of an interface that provides us the granularity we have, the multiples of 100 gig on the trunk side and on the line side, or on the client side, with the additional reach that we need for longer distances or the additional robustness that we need to build more complex networks. So all these standards are available and they have been used in a variety of use cases. Many companies are using this as a cost-effective way of connecting systems over direct fiber. And by the way, I should mention 400 gig is only one of the options that we have for DCO. 
Uh, we have had 100 gigabits per second, 200 gigabits per second digital coherent optics pluggables for a while. So that's also an option. But moving forward, if you want to go maybe outside the campus or you know, relatively shorter distances, digital coherent optics is going to be the way to go because the only choice that you probably have is if you want to use DWM or dark fiber, but with 400 gig, even for moderate dis distances, is the best technology that we have available today. Of course, the main use that uh, the industry has in mind for these pluggables is DWDM. So we, we have simple DWDM systems like point-to-point -point systems. I was talking to some of you this week here who are doing this. Fairly simple, you can go with 400 ZR up to 120 kilometers, but if you use OpenZR Plus or other specifications, you can go longer distances. If you use amplifiers, then things get more interesting because a full feature DWM system, when you have inline amplifiers, you can easily exceed a thousand kilometers at, 100 gig, uh, at 400 gigabits per second speeds. And if you play with the speeds, like if you down, uh, downgrade the speed to 100 gig, then you can go to thousands and thousands of kilometers using this technology. Now, the only Observation I would add here is that depending on the implementation, this range will vary a little bit. Uh, and using the so-called standard mode, we have tested distances of, of 12, 1,200 kilometers, 1,300 kilometers uh, in real fiber. And some of the more uh, recent implementations, they provide some better uh, specifications that allows us to go even further. And I'm going to mentioned that as well. Now, I, I'm not going to read this to you. I'm only providing this table for your reference, but as you can see here, uh, the key point is the specifications for these interfaces are simply amazing. So they are very, very close to a full featured DWM transponder. In fact, the latest generations of 400 gig DCO implementation, the gap between a full featured transponder and uh, DCO implementation is as small as 0.5 dBs in terms of OSNR uh, tolerance, which is like a key metric that we use to compare the performance of different optical uh, interface implementations. So we get all that benefits of the, you know, the compact implementation, the cost efficiency, without sacrificing the performance of these interfaces. So it's simply amazing what we are able to put into these small form pluggables. Now let's talk about how we manage this thing, right? Because the expectation in the industry is that given all the standards we have available, all the specifications we have available, that we're going to mix and match routers from, with pluggables from multiple vendors with DWM systems from various vendors. So we have three technology pieces coming from different places, different vendors and we want to manage this network. So how do we go about it? Well, first, we need to understand that given the nature of this pluggable, there's way more things to configure in the interface. Now, if in gray optics, all we need to care about is probably shut, no shut the interface, maybe do some breakout configuration on the interface. With digital coherent optics, because it's a DWM interface, we have to tune the frequency of the interface. We have to configure the modulation. So if you remember my picture on uh, coherent optics, we do have modulation options that we, we can play with. Each one with pros and cons, like in terms of how much data we can transport over a certain distance. Then we have also to configure the power level of the interface. Some implementations, we are going to have things like the deck rate, which really tells if you are doing oversampling of the signal or not to improve the signal performance. So there's way more things to configure. At the top you see the client speed. I'm going to show you a picture, but in digital coherent optics, we decouple the client speed from the trunk speed of the interface. And the way to go about it is you could configure all those uh, parameters one by one. But there are so many combinations that it's very easy to get it wrong. And 
<laughs> even though you can do that, uh, what we came up with in the industry is this idea of operational mode. So the idea of operational mode is instead of configuring all those things one by one, what you do is you use a single integer value, and that value is going to provide you a set of configurations that are optimized for a given use case. So it becomes easier not only to configure, but also to automate. So if you want to write code, or I'll show you an example, it becomes fairly simple to write code to configure these pluggable devices. Now, besides having way more things to configure, now we also have way more things to monitor in this interface. Now, I have to be very candid with you. If you are doing like simple designs, point to point, maybe a few miles away, probably you don't have to care about a lot of the stuff that you see in this slide here. However, if you are going to really uh, stretch the interface and go to the limits of the interface in terms of reach, then you have to pay close attention to some of these things like the noise level that you have in the signal, polarization mode dispersion that the signal is facing, especially if you have old fiber, chromatic dispersion like for ZR implementation, that uh, is the most limiting factor. Then you have to look at forward error correction because forward error correction in these implementations, it has something that we call the uh, waterfall effect, which means that it works great up to a certain point. And after you cross a given threshold, it's like binary, it starts working completely. And then of course you don't want to get close enough to the cliff, so you have to be very mindful on how the effect is operating the interface. So it becomes more, more sophisticated. Now the good news is that people have been monitoring these interfaces for a long, long time since coherent optics started to be used. Uh, the optical transport folks have been using these things to monitor these interfaces. And this show is no different from what you would have in a transponder implementation. The other good news is that for the first time, we have this data available in the router itself, and we can consume this data in more interesting ways, as we're going to see later. But the idea is that by having so much information about how the optical interface is behaving, instead of the traditional IP approach of you know, waiting for things to break in the optical domain to take some action, like conversion of IGP protocol, or start something like a fast reroute uh, protection of the traffic or such. Now we can use this data and maybe using some more sophisticated machine learning algorithms, we can be more proactive to take actions before things start to break in the network. So that's a very cool way of using this information now that's available in the router. So I included this picture for you for reference because guess what? If you are comfortable with CLI, everything I talked about is available in the CLI. So you are, of course, free to use CLI as much as, as you want. Yeah, there are more, there's more data to be monitored using the CLI, but everything is in there and you know it's easy enough to digest. That's the same for the DSP part of the interface, because now this interface has two components, has the optical component and the digital components. So there, we look at them separate, because in one uh, group of, of metrics that we collect, we care about the physical impairments. On the other set of metrics, and the DSP metrics, we care more how hard the SP is working, and we use that information differently. Also, something that you see here is something that is uh, very important for monitoring the health of the signal. So if you don't know anything about optical and all those uh, metrics that I showed to you, to you in the previous slide, one thing that would tell you a lot about the health of the signal is the so-called Q margin. So Q margin, the way to think about it is like a composite metric that we use and a positive number means the interface is healthy uh, if we get to zero, a negative number means that the system is not going to work. Now, the margin can be uh, taking into account when we design these networks, like some customers or some uh, network operators will set 
limits to this Q margin. Some will say, oh, I want to design the network to have 0.5 dBs or 1 dB of Q margin, something like that. And then we need to monitor to make sure that we don't cross that threshold or that we stay close enough to guarantee the health of the signal. Now we have all this configuration data and we have all this management data. And some people don't simply don't use CLI. Uh, you know, I would uh, say with a great degree of confidence that for the transport people in the room, probably you don't like CLI because it has not been part of optical systems. So how do we go about managing all this data without CLI? Now that we have more data to manage, we have the expectation from you that you want to have this information on a graphical user interface. It's a given for transport people. But not only that, if we're building anything that's today, the expectation is that we also want this to be easy to automate. So we need to have the APIs and the interfaces for automation. And not only that, we want to do automation using some sort of open framework. So it's not that we want to deal with uh, proprietary systems as we have done in the past. So how do we go about it? Now, the first thing that we can do is we can look at the industry and see what's going on in the industry and you know, all the work that's being done. Now, of course, there are many groups in the industry that have been looking at this problem over the past few years. First, we have OpenConfig, and OpenConfig has given us a lot of data models that we can use. And good news is that OpenConfig covers everything we need to configure and monitor these digital coherent optics interfaces using streaming telemetry. So we are covered on that. I'm going to come back to that later. Then we have the IETF. So IETF gives us the Yang language that we can use to create these data models, netconf, restconf interfaces, so all the APIs that we need. But it also provides us with a very nice framework called ACTN, Abstraction and Control of Traffic Engineered Networks, that we can use to build an open architecture to deal with this uh, type of implementation. Then we have OpenRodem. So OpenRodem also does Yang modeling, for disaggregated DWM systems. And it goes way uh, beyond what we find on IETF. So it goes all the way to model the optical devices or the optical line system itself. And it provides an SDN-centric framework for dealing with configuration and monitoring of these systems. And more recently, the Telecom Infra project also started looking at this problem. And they have been looking at different use cases for so-called IP over DWM. So that's how they describe this architecture where the routers implement the digital coin optics in interfaces. Uh, and they also are focusing on, a, on an SDN architecture for these various use cases. But as you can tell, we have no lack of options to work with to solve this problem in a more future-proof way using open architectures. Now let's look at open config in a little bit more details because I would say a lot of what we need to do is covered by what's available already by open config. Now when we look at the data models available uh, with open config, of course, I'm not going to go through all the data models with you here. There's lots of information available on the open config website and the tools they provide. But there are three nodes of interest for us for monitoring digital current optics. The first one is the terminal device, open config terminal device. Then we have the platform and platform transceiver. And each one is dealing with a different function of these digital current optics transceivers, if you will. An easier way to visualize this is like this. So if I take the digital coherent optics transceiver, we have these logical blocks. One is the links that are presented to the host that can be multiples of 100 gigabit ethernet or 400 gigabit ethernet. And those are the channels that the hosts are going to see. Then we have the so-called logical channel, which is really the aggregate of those logical channels. And depending on the implementation, if it's ZR or 
OpenZR Plus is going to be slightly different because one is more granular than the other. But here's where we are going to see the 100 gigabits per second, 200 gigabits per second, all the way to 400 gigabits per second channel. That's going to be mapped to the optical signal that's going to be sent through the fiber. As you can see, the terminal device deals with the logical channels in the open config uh, models, and the platform models deal with the optical channel um, attributes of the digital coherent optics. But everything we need is there, and I want to show you some examples later of how this looks like in practice. But this is another way to look at it. If I take the physical uh, pluggable and I slice it in these functions, this is what you're going to see. So the pluggable can present itself to the host as, in the case of ZR, 4 by 100 gigabit Ethernet or 400 gigabit Ethernet. Then this ma gets mapped to 400 gigabits per second only in the, open, uh, in the OIF specification and then gets mapped to the optical channel. The OpenZR Plus is more flexible, as we talked about, so we can present multiples of 100 gigabits per uh, 1 gigabit Ethernet to the host, or 1 400 gigabit Ethernet to the host. Now, the latest specification, if you look, it also talks about 200 gigabits per second, because some implementations support so-called 200 gigabit Ethernet. And then on the logical side, uh, the logical channel can be multiples of 100 gig as well. And we use that, as mentioned before, to give an extra performance to the signal in case you know, we want to leverage the pluggable, but we can't go all the way to 400 gigabit Ethernet. Now, this is how it looks like. So if you want to configure this pluggable using open config, it can be as simple as you can see here. So in this case, we're using the so-called operational mode configuration. So all we have to do is to set the power of the transceiver, the frequency of the optical cha channel, and the operational mode. So it can be as simple as that. And there's a very nice blog that my colleague Phil Bedard wrote that you can access through this link that goes through the details on how you can do that. But it can be very, very simple as you can see here to configure and, and to automate the configuration of these devices using open config. That's why I'm very optimistic about how we can do this moving forward. Now, if you want to collect data, then, of course, you can also use open config. This is a simple streaming telemetry data that we collect using GNMI. Again, lots of data that you can get with a very nice frequency, as I'm going to show later. Now, OpenConfig gives us the interfaces and the data models. But how do we go about the software architecture that is going to consume these, these data and these APIs? Now, there are multiple frameworks available in the industry. Uh, OpenRodom, as I mentioned before, has its own framework probably TIP is going to come up with another framework. And we have this ACTN framework from IETF. But there's one thing that's common between them, and it's this idea of using a hierarchical software architecture. So instead of creating one piece of software that deals with every problem that we have to deal with in the integrated IP and optical designs, we divide and conquer or we use a divide and conquer approach. So the idea is that we can use domain specific controllers. For example, in this IETF architecture, uh, we call them the provisioning network controllers. And there could be a PNC or a domain controller for the optical network, one for the IP network, or multiple if you are dealing with multiple vendors, like each optical vendor ca can have its own optical controller. And then on top of that, we put a hierarchical controller in this IETF architecture, it's called the multi-domain service controller. And this multi-domain is going to render all the information to build an end-to-end -end network that will allow us to configure and deal with this complex network. 
Now, there are other, as I mentioned, other examples of how you can do that. But this is proven to be a well, uh, a very good solution and it's well known in the industry and we have some implementations of this type of architecture already. Now, I talked about streaming telemetry. Now, with the streaming telemetry, all we have to do is to point to the nodes we want to monitor in that open config model that I talked about. By the way, I'm talking about open config, but yesterday I talked to some of you, in case you prefer to use vendor-specific data models, of course, those are available as well. But in the case of open config, all you have to do is point to the right nodes or the nodes that you're interested on, and then publish that information as you wish. And the way to consume that, well, first, that data is going to probably going to go to some collector uh, or some data gateway that's going to uh, consolidate all the data for you from multiple networks, multiple devices. And then we can use any tool to consume that data. Now in this case, here's something we have been showing a lot is Grafana because everybody knows Grafana. And as you can tell here, you can create some very interesting dashboards using Grafana to monitor all those configuration and telemetry data that we talked about earlier. But here you see the power levels, the Q factor, OSNR margins, the modulation, the frequency of the signal. It can get very fancy. There are you know, so many things that you can do using Grafana. So in our case, uh, we usually show these two dashboards. It can be as simple as sophisticated as you want. And the best of all is that you get to decide what you want to see in the screen, right? So you have a lot of freedom to build your own dashboards if you want. And the other good thing about this architecture is now we have this, all this data at much higher frequencies. So instead of the traditional 15 minutes intervals that we get in transport networks, now we can go very granular. We can go all the way to seconds. So in this case, we could do 30 seconds versus the traditional 15 minutes that we get in transport networks. Now, a lot of things, everything I talked about becomes more than a technology problem because in some cases, even though we have all these tools on the technology side, the way companies are organized make the solution to this problem a little bit harder than we would expect because usually the philosophy is that transport things get managed by transport people including the transponder, and then IP things get managed by the IP network operations team. And now we have this DCO that takes all the transponder function into the router itself. How we go about it? Well, the good news is if you look at the split or logical split of the digital coin optics, the way it has been designed, allows us also to split the configuration and the telemetry data and send it and give access to different people using role-based access control. So in other, in other words, I can restrict the access of all the optical interface only to the optical people, whereas the IP people or the IP operations will only get to see and manage the links, the, the Ethernet link layer side of the interface. So that can be done and we know how to do that, and that can be done from an operator perspective, like to give access to the device itself, or we can do that at the network uh, management and controller layer. And, and this is, as I mentioned before, is not a solution to the 20 years or plus standing problem, but I think it's a very nice way to go about building this for the future. Now, just to wrap up, you know, a lot of times this is going to become a software integration problem. And as we know, there's no easy solution when we talk about software integration. Now, if you have something like you see here, a transport layer management, an IP layer management, and an upper layer management. So you could think about having the transport management collecting data from the routers. If it's a single vendor solution, that's easy to do. We know how to do it. But if it's a multi-vendor, it becomes challenging because it requires a lot of collaboration between the vendors. We could move the integration to the management layer itself, but I think we run into the same problem because if it's multi-vendor, it becomes trickier to do it. 
I believe that the way to go about it is really leaving all the integration to our upper layer management or hierarchical controller. Because we can use the frameworks we mentioned before, like the IETF, Open Rodem, TIP, eventually when they come up with their architecture, we have the frameworks to do that. And this upper layer management, the business model that companies use for this type of product is multi-vendor by nature, so you have much better chances, more incentives for people to do this integration for you. So let me wrap up. Digital coherent optics, as I mentioned before, is something that's coming your way. So <laughs> you need to learn how to deal with this thing. Eventually, it's going to cross your way because as we go 400 gig and above, there's no other way to connect devices in our network, even for shorter distances. Now, the good news is that the technology is amazing. Uh, and we, in terms of management, I hope I shared some ideas with you, uh, but the industry has been working hard on how to solve this problem. We have a lot of tools available to monitor these pluggable optics. No matter where they are sitting, if they're sitting in the router, switch, or even modern transponders also use digital coherent optics. So we have open config, streaming telemetry, data models. We have everything we need to build future-proof solutions. Doesn't mean that we're solving the you know, decades-long problem that we have in the industry, given the proprietary nature of uh, management systems, especially the transport networks, tends thing to be very proprietary. Uh, but we have an opportunity to break that model and build something using these open architectures moving forward. So with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you, Emerson. Do we have any questions? We do. Uh, two questions on mine. Um, Michael Lambert from the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center asks, uh, is he correct that the 400ZR is the single standard for the 400 um, gigabit Ethernet DCO and tunable um, output power replaces the need for SR, LR, et cetera? So there are multiple specifications available, let's put it this way, in the industry for 400 gig DCO. So I provided three examples. Uh, the OIF ZR is the standard that is more commonly uh, referred to, but we have open road them, which you would argue is not you know, a standard, but is a solid specification, like an open specification from the industry. And we have open ZR plus as well. Now we do have vendor specific implementations as well. And so, but we do have a lot to work with, but the only standard, like real solid standard is indeed 400ZR. Now, the, I think the second part of the question is, are we replacing the gray optics uh, for dark fiber connectivity by uh, ZR moving forward? A lot of people are already doing that. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have more uh, gray optics specifications. We do need them for shorter distances, but even for moderate distances moving forward, DCO is going to be the way to go because there's no better way to, to do it. Because uh, it can be very complex to implement like 400 gig using multi WDM uh, lasers in the interface. That's, that's really hard to do it. So moving forward, we're going to see more, more of that for sure. And one more real quick one, if I may. Um, Jorge Amadio asks if there's a, a white paper or, or some other published work that he can refer to because of all the information he presented. It seems oh, uh, like there should be maybe something else that he can uh, read up on. Excellent question, indeed. Uh, if you go to Google and, uh, and search, there's a paper that I wrote on this subject. It's called Growing the Network with 400 Gig Digital Coherent Optics. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's a decent paper, like, Lots more uh, more information than I was able to cover here today. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Hi, I'm Scotty Benda. Work at a company called Light River. Um, excellent presentation today. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I just wanted to advertise, and I know I'm probably not supposed to do this, but we, my company, has been building element management systems for a long time from the proprietary nature. But because of the open and disaggregated solutions 
that are coming out, you know, we participate in the Open ZR Plus, even the Open XR forums. And um, we actually have a platform that manages over 300 different network elements and works with the Acacia, Cisco platforms, the Marvell, the Coherent, the Infinera, and then even the uh, the Sienna platforms from a you know 400 gig coherent optic. And it's real nice. It has APIs that you can plug in and take advantage of all the open config and rest conf and all those different types of APIs and then represent the entire transport plus routed infrastructure visually. So just wanted to give you guys, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I can, yeah. you know. Well, it's, it I think it's a good validation to what I mentioned because even though I didn't put brands in the boxes, uh, there are actual implementations and we have been working with you uh, for a while. And yeah realizing this model that I mentioned before. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tony Tauber from Comcast. I, so with all that um, extra management and the ends of the uh, links, like how, what do you think of as the challenges to like kind of merging that into a, right, a, a kind of coherent view with the line side systems and all that stuff? Uh, well, maybe if you could elaborate more on the question, well, I mean, if there's any, you know, things that are happening in the middle uh, that that might give feedback into, you know, where faults are and so forth. Uh. Oh, yes. Okay, so um, we do have more data indeed on the router interface to monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually what we do is we look at some very specific data, like uh, if we have some thresholds on the PMD, uh, we know more or less it's a fiber problem. If there's OSNR, mm -hmm. then we start looking at amplifiers. And I mean, there are techniques to, to deal with uh, the troubleshooting of these networks. That's why the optical people need this kind of information. Right. Uh, and, and we make it available. As we could see here, it's, it's available. And, and the way to think about it is really, you know, uh, what we're doing here is no different than the industry direction we have seen even before DCO started to implement to be implemented in routers because the disaggregation of the optical network is a given these days. Uh, you know, lots of companies, they buy transponders independently from the so-called line system. So the consolidation of the data from multiple vendors is a problem that we had to solve anyways. Uh, open config contributed a lot to what we needed to do. Uh, open Rodem came in, gave the extra data we need for the line system. Okay. You know, the consolidation of the data, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem that's being solved uh, already by, by many companies. So I think it's no, no different from what you would have otherwise without digital current optics in the routers. And that's why we need that um, separation of the data to the transport people. We need to give them what they need to do their troubleshooting. And we have the ways to do that. Thanks. Thank you. Another online question, this one from uh, Blake Willis from Zeo. Yes, how far away do you think that we are from being able to use coherent optics uh, in routers that are uh, not from the same vendor, particularly beyond the standard 400ZR? Oh, so uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, in fact, uh, if any of you have a chance to participate at OFC next month, uh, OFC, since last year, they have been running uh, what they call PlugFest, where they mix and match uh, the whole equipment, be it routers, switches, uh, and pluggables from multiple vendors. They do all sorts of uh, combinations. So you can have a uh, vendor A router with a pluggable from vendor B on one side, line system from vendor C on the, in the middle, and then on the other remote side, you are going to see yet another combination of pluggables and host equipment. So that there's a lot. Actually, they published a paper last year on all the interrupt they did for 400 ZR. Now, when we talk about non-ZR implementations like OpenZR Plus, uh, then things get a little bit more interesting because uh, usually for uh, the non-ZR implementations, uh, all the vendors, they have the so-called standard mode, which is really the OpenZR Plus specification as it has been defined by the, the MSA. And they have the so-called enhanced implementation, which tends to be proprietary in nature. And what I would uh, say is that some of the companies that are using this technology have been doing a lot of testing on their own. There have been papers published by some companies. So if you're interested, uh, please reach out. But I can tell you they're public 
uh, trials that have been documented by some large companies here in the US where they have uh, OpenZR Plus implementations from multiple vendors um, interworking inter in the same network. There's one that uh, it's, uh, was also announced at the OFC last year where uh, the, the company tested two vendors. One vendor was uh, Acacia on one side and a second vendor on the remote side, over 1,200 kilometers of fiber uh, over a third-party GWM line system. So it has been proven as well. I think as an industry, we had to do more work to have more of those plug fests for OpenZR Plus. But I expect to see that, that uh, more of that moving forward. All right, thank you. I believe that concludes our questions. So thanks again to Emerson for his great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.